All right, Genesis chapter 1. I'm going to give you a little break from Hebrews tonight. Genesis chapter 1. I've been going through the Bible, making a lot of notes, and uh, I've been in Genesis 1-1 for the last week and a half, making notes on that first verse. And, and believe it or not, guys, I'm not just saying that. There's a lot there. Once you really start meditating on it and truly, truly thinking about what the first verse of the Bible says. Genesis 1-1 says, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. Right there, if you believe that verse, you just left Richard Dawkins, Stephen Hawking, Neil deGrasse Tyson, and every other materialistic, profane scientist in the dust. Yep. You just left them. If you believe that single verse right there, you're so far ahead of them, they're never going to catch you again, and you don't owe any of them an apology. Right. You don't have to argue or refute their pseudoscience. The reality is the pseudoscientists of this world who come up with atheism and Darwinian evolution did it out of a motive of a motive of getting rid of their God conscience so that they can do the things which are not convenient. Paul tells you that in Romans chapter 1. The motive of getting rid of the creator is so that man can live in his ungodliness and unrighteousness without any fear or, or consequence. Amen? But here you have the first statement of the greatest book ever written. Amen? Amen? Greatest book ever written. Not only is it the greatest book ever written, it's the highest authority of heaven and earth. David said in the Psalms, Thy word is true from the beginning, and every one of God's righteous judgments endureth forever. From this single point right here, you're handling the only truth the world has. It's true from the beginning, and everything that it says endures forever. You can rest your soul and everything upon the truths and the realities of this book. Amen? Yeah. And it's the greatest treasure that mankind possesses. I'd rather have a King James Bible living in a cardboard box on a street than I would to have all the treasures of Mark Cuban, Donald Trump, Bill Gates, or any of them. Amen? Yeah. I believe if you got that book, you got the greatest treasure that's ever been given to mankind. Amen? This was the first book ever printed. Y'all know that? First book ever printed on the modern printing press was a, was, a, was a Bible. Not the King James Bible, but a Bible. First book ever printed. Guess what? They're still publishing and printing more of those books a year than any other book known to man. They've been mass producing the King James Bible now for over 400 years. And it's the only book that you can pull up on any continent with a truckload full of them and have people swarm your truck and beg for copies of it. And see, that hurts the feelings of men like Stephen Hawkins and Richard Dawkins. And I know Stephen Hawking is dead. It's what happens to sinners. Get over it. Richard Dawkins is going to go the same way. Amen? Yep. But it hurts these men's feelings that they got all the accolades, all the PhDs and doctorates and all the intellect and all the higher education, and they spent hundreds of thousands of dollars to get this learning, and men would still rather hear the words of Moses and David 2,000 years after they're dead, 3,000 years after they're dead, 4,000 years after they're dead. It hurts their feelings. Amen? Let me tell you something. No man ever thought that anything Richard Dawkins said was worth his life. Nobody has ever risked their lives to get the theories of Albert Einstein to other men. Countless millions thought the words in this book were worth their own life. Amen? Amen? And so you got something precious here. Precious. In the first verse of that Bible, you see three statements there. The first statement is in the beginning. Right? In the beginning. That's a statement of time. Well, if in the beginning, am I spelling that right? Beginning. It just looked weird. In the beginning, God created. Well, guess what? If God did something in the beginning, then that verse right there has nothing to do with God. That statement right there has nothing to do with him. Amen? If God did something in the beginning, that means God is not 
existing within the realm of time. He's eternal. That God created, what did he create? He created the heaven and the earth. So what you have here in the first verse is the beginning of these two things right here. Amen? Now, right there's a statement of time. God set something in motion back here. And what the Bible's going to be about is the historical record of the heaven and the earth. Look at Genesis 2.4. Genesis 2.4, what's that the generations of? The generations of the heavens and the earth. Amen. Where do you live? You live in the earth, right? So this is your generations. This is your history. This is your story. But it all began with God creating something. Now, when you, when you, if you really consider and just meditate upon that verse, lay, lay down sometimes, stand still, and really just think about the fullness of what you just read, that verse gets to the very heart of reality. Reality. What reality? Existence. You don't need a Bible to tell you that you exist. Right? We are all material existing in the current of time. Amen? You, listen, nobody's trying to shove religion down your throat at this point. We're, we're telling you something that you can get with the five God-given senses you've got in your body. It's called natural revelation. It's the first thing God ever says to a man. And if a man don't accept this first revelation by faith... That Bible has nothing to say to him. That Bible begins with the assumed fact that you believe God created what you experience. Amen. Yeah. Yeah. He that cometh to God must believe that he is. Mm -hmm. And he is the rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Now there's many cultures that believe this fact. But what the cultures have done is they've taken that fact of natural revelation and they've corrupted the image of that God in their imagination. That's called paganism. That's called idolatry. Just because you be saying, I believe in God, is one of the most generic things a person can say. Amen? The majority of this world believes in God, but they don't know Him. They profess they know God, but in works deny Him. Being abominable and unto every good work reprobate. And so, and so the reality, we're talking about reality. We're not talking about religion at this point. We're talking about the simple fact that there's seven and a half billion people on this earth in hell and in exhale an atmosphere that was created to give them life. <gasps> they never even consider it. Every breath that a man takes is a gift of God. He created the atmosphere that you suck in 24-7. Amen? And as you're sitting there sucking in that air, as you're sitting there right now, you've got a heart sitting there pounding. And your blood is carrying life to that body. The life of the flesh is in what? The blood. God gave you a heart that pumps blood throughout that body, and that body carries life to every living part of your body. The eye, the foot. Amen? The organs. That blood is doing things right now that man can't even begin to comprehend the fullness of what that blood is doing. Amen? And as you're sitting here, you ever consider the fact you got two eyeballs in your head and light is traveling all around us and reflecting and bouncing off of shapes and different, and it has different wavelengths to it and color and your, your eyes receive them photons of light, transfer it into an electrical signal through the optic nerve, it goes to the brain and your brain's able to compute that electrical signal to give you an image in your mind. You ever consider that? I have a mouth right now, right? Man has a mouth. You know what distinguishes man from every other creature? You know what makes him more in the image of God than anything? Is the ability to speak. Amen? The only creature that has it. You ever consider how weird a mouth is, though? We make these little audible sounds with our mouth, different syllables. And I'm able to take those sounds and communicate intelligent thought into the air. 
And you're able with your ears to receive them sound waves and compute in your mind. We're, communi- we're two souls communicating through speech. That's reality. That's not, that's, not, that's not me standing up here giving you religion. Those are facts. Right? That we are existing. Nobody can argue that. We exist. The question is, is how? How has all this happened? When did it happen? Now, that, now listen, how and when, we could say who, what, when, and where. But the greatest question is not why, but is there a why? Is there any meaning to any of it? Because if Genesis 1-1 is true, If that statement right there is true, you know what I learned from that verse? There was intent and purpose behind the origin. Amen? If it ain't true, there is no why. There is none. Right? Turn yourselves into boys and girls and murder, rape, pillage, do whatever you want to. There's no why to why we're here. Amen? You know, you know the, if evolution is true, you know who the smartest man is in the world? The man lifting weights to make sure he can beat your guts in and take whatever you got. That's the law of the jungle. The lions do it every day in Africa. They wake up and feast on the weak. They turn them into prey. If evolution is true, why are we locking up the most able to survive in our society? Why are we protecting the weak? You see, the evolutionist has no guts to live and practice what he believes and preaches. Yeah, there you go. Zero. Amen? You know where, you know where we got our, our innate desire to help what's weak? We got it from our creator. Amen? That book from cover to cover is about judging the widow and the fatherless and the weak and the afflicted and having compassion and pity. Evolution, man, evolution. Is is there a point to our origin? What's the point to it? Is there any purpose to our existence? But here's here's a question I got for him. What what I'm hoping to get accomplished by this, guys, is I'm going to rant a little bit tonight, but what I hope to get accomplished is is to get you out of your inferiority complex to the scientist of this world. You are above them. You are a member of the head of all principality and power. You are now a member of the body of the one who created all things. You don't owe these guys anything. You don't have to go dig in the dirt with them trying to explain stuff to them. The invisible things of God are clearly seen. It ain't up to you to show the natural man what God has already clearly showed them. You as a son of God got a higher calling than arguing with the evolutionist about why man has a tailbone. Creation already declares to every living man that there is an all-powerful divine God. You as God's sons are putting on display the mystery of godliness which is God manifest in the flesh. We ain't got time to go back to grade school with Dawkins and Neil deGrasse Tyson. But let me ask you this, because here's what an evolutionist will never address. Evolution, if evolution is true, evolution would be more than just my body. Where I lost my tail and my fur and all this stuff. If evolution is true, man's entire history is the product of evolution. His conscience His morals, his beliefs, all are a product of evolution. It's more than natural. Amen? So let me ask you this. Why does the Darwinian monkey men, and that's what I'll call them, why do the Darwinian monkey men and the atheists of this world despise man's consciousness of God so much? Because the history of man's God consciousness would have to be a product of evolution if evolution is true. Meaning man evolved to believe in a God. 
Why does the evolutionist hate it so much? Stephen Hawking's the only one that ever had the guts to talk about it. Stephen Hawking said, if evolution is true, he didn't say if evolution is true, he said the hardest thing for me to get my head wrapped around being an evolutionist is to accept the fact that I have no free will. Stephen Hawking said that. And if you have no free will, there is no more guilt. Live it up, baby. That means every pedophile, every serial killer is the product of evolution, not free will or choices. Hawking said it. Amen? Free will is an illusion. You know what that means? That Bible you hold in your hand came through evolutionary process. So why does the evolutionist hate it? Come on. Those are not formulated through anything other than evolution. Evolutionists don't want to talk about these things. Why does Bill not a science guy? What a, what a clown. He's a clown. And anybody that would set their children in front of a clown that ain't in a circus needs their head examined. Bill Nye the science guy said, for you to teach your Bible to your children is child abuse. Bill Nye said that. Now, why does Bill Nye despise this Bible so much? When it's just as much a part of evolution as his stupid textbooks and his television show. If evolution is true, that means your Bible came through evolution. But now, now we got some serious questions, don't we? Because if man's beliefs, his conscience, his morals, his development of right and wrong, if all of those things came through evolutionary process... Now we got some serious questions. Number one correct question would be, is if there is no God, why was it so necessary for us to evolve this false belief? Why did evolution see it essential that we develop this false belief worldwide? Y'all follow me? This is where evolution falls on its face. Well, we can set talk about the tailbone, which, by the way, you got a tailbone because there's five muscles connected to it that you use in reproduction. They lie, and they lie to get rid of God consciousness in creation so that they can do what's not convenient. Mutilate their genitalia, sleep with whatever they want to sleep. That's why when they started corrupting God, God said, you go ahead and do everything your little unclean heart desires. And I'll see you on judgment day. Because one thing you're not going to get rid of is the creator's rights to what he made. Amen. He'll give you up to uncleanness, vile affections. He'll let you do those things which are not convenient. But he's already told you that they which do such things are worthy of death. Right. Amen? Amen? Evolution never wants to address these issues of the evolution of man's beliefs and religion. Why, why was believing in a God so necessary to our survival? Because that's all evolution is about, right? Ensuring and guaranteeing our survival. Well, if evolution, if we evolved this belief in God, why was this belief in God so necessary to our divide? Or, or survive on why did we evolve to have so many differing views of God? You don't, you, do, you see, you got to follow me. Your thoughts are not your own if evolution is true. Right. Your beliefs are not your own. Debate is pointless at this point. For a scientist to even try to educate you out of your belief in God is laughable because your belief in God came from evolution. Nothing, everything's relative at this point now. But what I, here's, here's my question about evolution. Do you know how many cultures prior to us offered their offspring to pagan gods? What kind of plan is that to ensure our survival? 
that we evolved to believe in these myths and then took the next generation of our survival and offered them in sacrifice to these lies. Boy, evolution, man. That's some, man, it, Bill. You know how many wars have been fought in the name of gods? If evolution is true, why was it necessary for us to evolve and to believe in these myths? Amen, evolutionists won't deal with it. Only to, in a short time, evolve into creatures that are atheists. After thousands of years of bloodshed and killing our own offspring to appease these evolutionary lies. And now wonder, wonderful evolution in guaranteeing the survival of our species has evolved us into men and women that mutilate our reproductive organs. And God is believing the lie that men can have babies. Thanks, evolution. It's laughable. You know what it is? It's a fairy tale for grown-ups. It's to put you to bed at night with a good conscience because you don't believe there's a God anymore. It's a fairy tale. It's a bedtime story for sinners who don't like being conscious of God and His wrath. You see, the evolutionist wants us to believe that he knows what happened 14.6 billion years ago. Right? I mean, you should turn somebody like that off. It's like, it's, like I, it's like I said, how much access does the material man have to all knowledge? Would y'all agree that Stephen Hawking had very limited access into everything that can be known? And I'm supposed to believe that this man with his limited access to all knowledge concluded that 14.6 billion years ago there would have been no material or time for God to exist in? Well, no kidding. God is not material, nor is he finite. He's the eternal spirit. That'd be like me saying, well, if you go back far enough, there was no Microsoft, therefore Bill Gates couldn't have existed. Amen. He's trying to comprehend the creator in the laws of, of the creature. 14, listen, they want you to believe they knew, know what I just gave you about man's written history of religion, beliefs in God. I can't take a man serious who's trying to tell me what happened 14.6 billion years ago when he's too blind and stupid to even discern his own history. Man's history of religion and God consciousness does not reflect evolutionary development. You know what it reflects? It reflects a common origin that became corrupted throughout history. That's what it reflects. Just like Paul said in Romans chapter 1. When they knew Him, they didn't glorify Him. They weren't thankful. They become vain in their imaginations. And their foolish hearts were darkened. And they took the truth of God and turned it into a lie. That's man's history. Does it reflect evolutionary development? Man began here and fell straight to hell. Yep. Evolution has you beginning here and climbing up. Yeah. Yeah. It's what we call Luciferianism. Y'all know the, the phoenix, right? Rising from the ashes, order out of chaos. I know the philosophy. Listen, man. When you know God and His truth, you become more aware of His adversary. Because the more you know about the truth of God, the more you know about the one who perverts and corrupts that truth. You ain't going to kill me with the philosophies of this world. The Hegelian dialect, order out of chaos, I know exactly what that stuff comes from. It's Satan breaking down the order and structure of this world to erect a new order of which he's the God of. You ain't going to kid me, man. You ain't dealing with Joel Osteen and John Hagee up here, man. We know where we're at and what we're doing today. 
Evolution. They can't even understand their own history. How am I supposed to expect them to know the origin? Amen? People say, oh, you preacher, you don't understand how evolution works. I promise you I understand it better than most. Y'all know when the last ice age began? Now, of course, it's, it's all mythological. But y'all know, according to them, when the last ice age began? 2.4 million years ago, we entered into our last, been five ice ages. You entered into the last one 2.4 million years ago, according to scientists. Believe it or not, with all the talks of global warming, they tell you you're still living in that ice age. Now, keep up with me, 1.2 million years ago, which is exactly from right now to the beginning of the last ice age, it's exactly halfway in the middle of that ice age, they tell you you evolved to lose your fur. I feel so stupid even Googling that stuff, Bill. When did man lose his fur? I feel so stupid even asking them questions. But I'm supposed to believe that evolution thought it was a good idea for us in the middle of an ice age to lose our fur. Only to kill animals and put their fur on. Amen. Look at me. I'm supposed to believe that evolution could create the complexity of my brain, the heart, the digestive system, the immune system, all these complex systems within the human body. If evolution is true, everything you now see is a product of the creature. The creature created itself. That means that the simplest life form, cells, was able to develop these complex systems. And when it was done, when it was all complete, the man didn't even have a capacity to build a hammer. There you go. Are you with me? How can the singlest cells develop the most complex if this genius was existent within the creature, why did the creature not have the ability, even to this day, to develop anything as complex as that? Man has never built anything as complex as the brain. You say, well, how do you explain it with God? Well, if man is the product of the creator, that creator decides what he gives and withholds from the creature. You cannot have a self-creating creature that's dumber than what it was in its simplest form. But if there's a creator and God puts it on display, you know what he says about the ostrich? He said the ostrich lays her eggs on top of the ground, in the sand, in the dirt, because she forgetteth that a foot may squash them, crush them. You know why she forgets that? It says, because God hath withheld wisdom from her. That means every creature that you see out there building a nest and taking care of its young is doing so from an innate wisdom given to them by the Creator. And when He withholds that wisdom, that creature displays what's been withholding. Now, God created man. And he gave man a lot of wisdom, and he gave man free will to develop. Amen? But this stuff right here, you have, to be, you have to be half lunatic to believe that stuff. I mean it. You either have to be, you either, you either have to have no brains to believe this, or you despise God and his judgment so much, you're looking for any reason in the world to get rid of him. That's it. I know the motives of man. Now listen, what most evolutionists will not tell you is that if evolution is true, me and you have no free will. Right. We don't. Amen? Why are we locking up serial killers? Can anybody answer that question? Now, not from a God perspective. 
See, I can answer why we do that stuff with this. God gave man authority back in Genesis chapter 10. Right? To exercise power and authority over evil men in this earth. But if this one's true, why are you locking up the pedophile? Why are you locking up the serial killer? He had no choice in the matter. Evolution made him that way. Every thought, every desire, every evil thing he ever did, he did because he was what, he, what evolution decided he should be. Shut the governments down. Amen. Open up the prisons. And just every man do what evolution created him to do. Amen. Now I'm sure the evolutionist will run his mouth. Oh, you don't truly understand. I understand it perfectly. I understand it perfectly. Amen. There is no wisdom nor understanding against God. Anything that tries to exalt itself against the knowledge of God, God has given us weapons to pull them down. That is a self-defeating system. So full, it's full of so many loopholes, it's not even funny. Amen? Look at Genesis 1.1. And what I want you to understand, guys, is if you're going to debate the evolutionist, you have to believe some things that God has already said. You don't battle him on his intellect. I know from Romans 1 that that guy already knows two things. A man, what may be known of God has been showed to him, and he knows, that ju- he knows the judgment of that God. He don't need a Bible to tell it to him. He's here. That declares there's a God, and he's heading toward a graveyard. That tells him his judgment. Amen? God granted existence to man and God stops that existence at death and the reason that judgment came upon all men is because all have sinned the judgment came upon all men to condemnation amen you don't debate an evolutionist or try to refute evolution on scientific terms amen you don't battle his intellect get to his consciousness of God because it's there I promise you it's there Amen? Look in Genesis 1.1. Because that's what Satan wants to do, guys. He wants to overwhelm you with so much information, you just lose heart. Amen? Genesis 1.1. In the beginning, God created. Well, what does that tell you? It tells you that God is not finite, nor is he material. You know what Christ Christ told you what God was? John 4.24. God is a what? A spirit. If he's spirit, then he's not material. Right? He's spiritual. That's why the material man, the natural man, cannot discern the things of the Spirit of God. Eye can't see, ear can't hear, heart cannot imagine. God is a spiritual being. Those that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. And if any man is going to know the things of the Spirit of God, they can only be discerned spiritually. Now, there's some things about God the natural man can receive. His eternal power and Godhead. That's Romans chapter 1. That's what may be known of God by nature. But outside of natural revelation, the only way man can truly know the things of the Spirit of God is through spiritually discerning them. So if God is an eternal spirit, He's not bound by time or matter. How foolishness is it for a man who's only been here for 30, 40, 50 years, only discerning what he can discern through his senses and his body, do you really think that man has been able to conclude that that eternal spirit does not exist? It's laughable. It's laughable. I heard, I heard, uh, this is the product of American education. You ready? I had a woman tell me one time that we have theories now that prove there is no God. Theories proving that there is no God. No, we have theories that help you sleep better at night. 
They haven't proved anything. Look at Jude. Let me teach you something here. Come to the book of Jude. I want to show you guys that you... You standing in the presence of the greatest minds of humanity, you've got something that you need to start believing you have. Look at Jude verse 19. Well, look at verse 18 first. How they told you there should be mockers in the last time who should walk after their own ungodly lusts. These be they who separate themselves, get that next word, sensual, having not the what? Spirit. Remember when Paul said the natural man don't receive these things. Do you know what a sensual man is? A sensual man can only know what can be discerned by his senses. He's sensual. He doesn't have the spirit. Amen? Amen. So that means a sensual man, there's all this spiritual information that the sensual man don't have access to. Amen? Amen? I want you to know, who have known the mind of the Lord? But we have the mind of Christ. We've got access to information these guys will never get access to, no matter how many Hubbles, how many billions of dollars, how many submarines, how far they go down into the earth, how high they go up into heaven. Amen. Because you know what Job said? You'll find gold down there. You'll find iron down there. Bread comes out of the earth. You'll find all these things in the earth, but where's the place of wisdom? Where shall it be found? You know what the heavens say? It's not up here. You know what the deep says? It's not down here. You know what Job said? It's not found in the land of the living. Yeah. Good luck finding something that ain't found in the land of the living. You know what Job concluded? The fear of the Lord, that is wisdom. And the depart iniquity is understanding. God is looking in this earth and finds the man that fears him and departs iniquity. A man that fears God and departs iniquity is a man of wisdom and understanding. Amen? You know where you'll find that man? The only place where God can be known by his spirit. Amen? Now, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. In the beginning. I'll be winding down here in just a second. In the beginning means time, right? And it's important for you to understand what time it is. Y'all believe that? Right? I mean, God, we get little light, we get little practices in this in our everyday life, right? There's things we do at a certain time of the day, right? If we didn't know what time it was, man, it'd be chaos, right? But there's a lot of Christians that don't know what time it is. Remember when Paul said, knowing the time, that now it is high time to awake out of sleep, for now is our salvation nearer than when we believed? Because we know the time. Now, how, how you seven and a half billion people in the world, how many of them even understand the time? Christ rebuked the Jews for this. Show us a sign. He said, when you see a red sky in the evening, you say it'll be fair weather. But if you see it in the morning time, you say, "Lo, it's going to be foul weather. He said, you hypocrites. How can you discern the face of the sky and not discern the signs of the times? Amen? Time. How many of y'all think it's important to understand time? Amen. The Bible begins in the beginning. God set something in motion when he created it. And you were born into it. I was born into it 42 years ago. I just came in to existence. In earth. In this process that God began. Back in Genesis 1.1. I'm now in the current of that time. It's moving forward. With or without you. I mean it's going forward. And the only thing that's going to stand when all time is over. Is God's counsel. Nothing else anybody else is doing in time 
is going to amount to anything. All other wisdom comes to nothing. Only God's wisdom is going to endure. Amen? God said, find another one like me declaring the end from the beginning. Saying, my counsel shall stand and I will do all my pleasure. Find another man who can do that. Find any other creature or living being that can do that. Right? We exist. We're here. We're, we're living on the earth in this process of time. And it's moving forward. Right? What is your life but a vapor that appeareth for a short time and then vanishes away? And you're living right smack dad in the middle of this process that God began back in Genesis 1-1. And every year, 64 million people leave time. At the rate of 175,000 people a day. In this process, there's a time to be born and a time to die. You enter it here, you leave there. You only got a small portion of this process that God began in Genesis 1-1. And it's important for you to understand where you're at in that process of time. Noah didn't live when you did. Noah had a completely different present and future than you do we talk about time past but now ages to come right well Noah's time past was the fall and the corruption of Adam's gene genealogies at Noah's present was God telling him the earth is corrupt and there's a flood coming so the flood was his future it's your past Where you're living at in time is important for you to know and understand. Amen? If you want to get along with God and labor with God and what he's doing, what did Paul say? Redeeming the time for the days are evil. Wherefore be ye not unwise but understanding what the will of the Lord is. The days you're living in are evil. And the only man that can redeem time to the will of God is a man that understands and comprehends the will of the Father. Amen? And so time is important. It's all through your Bible. Look at Genesis chapter 4. We've looked at some of this stuff before, but... Don't y'all love this book, man? I kiss this book on a daily basis, man. It's the only thing I got in the physical world I can kiss, Bill, that, that, that's representative of God. Amen? That's God's spirit right there. That book was given to me by the inspiration of God. Look at Genesis 4.3. And in process, notice two things here. Process of time, it came to pass. It. Right? That, that it is a... Now, he's going to tell you what the it is, but basically what time is is a process by which things come to pass. So when we say process, process of time, what does that mean in the process of time? Well, that's where we get words like procedure, right? Procession. If there's a, if there's a funeral procession, what does that mean? It's, it's, a, it's a moving forward of cars in a funeral procession, right? Proceed. What does proceed mean? Go forward. So what is time? Time is something that God set in motion here and it's been moving forward ever since. It's a process. And in that process, as time moves forward, things come to pass. That's why we call back there past. It's things that have already passed us. And so we measure this. We measure this in according to God's measurements. Seconds, right? Minutes, hours. What are we measuring? We're measuring this moving forward, right? Right? It can be measured, seconds, minutes, hours, days, months, years, decades, right? Centuries, millennia. It's moving forward, and you ain't going to stop it. Amen. There's no possible way to stop this process down. God set it in motion, and it does have an end to it. Amen. We're going to see that, but there's an end to this time. But in this, in this time, God in the beginning created the heaven and the earth, and then what did he do? First day. Second day, third day, fourth day, it's moving forward, right? You get to Daniel, you know what he says? Seventy weeks are determined upon thy people. That's a set amount of time that's been determined by God upon Israel. Those things have to be fulfilled. 
Mark, you know the first words out of Christ's mouth in Mark? The time is fulfilled. The time is fulfilled. Amen? That book is a, is a book of time. And so I hope you understand that. Time exists in three states, past, present, and future. Past are things that have already happened. Present are the things happening now. And the future are things that are to come to pass hereafter. Amen? So when we get up here and draw timelines, all the Christians that make fun of us for drawing them timelines because they don't even understand what the Bible's about. The Bible is a book of a, per a procession of time. Things happened before you got here. And you better, you better understand what God showed you happened before you got here. Amen? You better understand what God is doing now. Because if you don't understand that things happened in time that changed what was going on back here, the death of, the, the death of Christ on the cross was an event that happened in time that made major changes to the way God is dealing with the creature now. But what do they do? They want to run back there, be back in Exodus. Leviticus. When Leviticus, when the writer of Hebrews tells you the things in Leviticus was imposed on them until, until is a process of time. God put those things there and they were imposed upon them until the time of reformation. That's time. The law was our schoolmaster to bring us to Christ. Here's a good one. Here's a good one. He says, in, in, he says, when we were children, we were kept under the law. Or when we were children, we were under tutors and governors until the time appointed of the Father. And when the, when the fullness of time was come, when the fullness of time was come, God sent forth His Son, made of a woman, made under the law to redeem them that were under the law. You know what He says? Something major changed. Thou art no more a servant, but a son. Something changed. In the process of time. Amen. Y'all understand that about time. Look at Ecclesiastes chapter 3. I promise. I'm going to shut up here soon. Gary ain't even held up the stop sign yet. That means I got at least 30 minutes. <laughs> Look at Ecclesiastes chapter 3. Verse 1. To everything there is a season and a time to every purpose under the heaven. Amen. A time to be born and a time to die. Time to plant, time to pluck up, a time to kill, a time to heal. All down through there. And look at what he says in verse 10. I have seen the travail which God hath given to the sons of men to be exercised in it. Do you know, what, you know what your present time is? It's an exercise given by God. Now all the Christians want to get rid of at least half of the things in the list. The time to pluck up, the time to break, the time to kill, the time. They want to get rid of all the negative. But you know what? The creature that God made you better get this, man, because you're not the creator. We don't get to stand down here and point our finger at the creator and tell him how he gets to run the show. Amen. This creature that he made right now is subject to vanity. Read Ecclesiastes. That's what it's about. This same creature... Is subject to hope. God, who made heaven and earth, the creature was made subject to vanity, not willingly, but by reason of him who have subjected the same in hope. There's a reason behind the vanity of this world. God had a reason behind subjecting the creature to vanity. The same creature that's in vanity 
is also sub subject to hope. But there's something you're supposed to be exercised in right now. Paul understood it. Paul got to the point, man, where he took pleasures in the current infirmities and sufferings of this present time. Amen? But you know what man does? Man sits down here in his little, his little speck of time. That's what you look like in the process. We laugh, we dance, we mourn, we lose, we win, we kill, we heal. We go through all that stuff. And man goes through that whole process from birth to death. And you know what most of them never learn? They never learn. Look, at, look down there, I think it's verse 11 or 12 in Ecclesiastes 3. He hath made everything beautiful in his time. Y'all see that verse? He hath made everything beautiful in his time. He also hath set the world in their heart so that no man may find out the work that God maketh from the beginning to the end. Y'all see that? You know what that tells me about time? It ain't about what you're doing in it. It's insignificant. Everything you're doing in time is vanity. Amen? It's about what God is doing from the beginning to the end. That means this process he set in motion back here has an end out there. And when that end comes, God will have made a work that he's been doing from the beginning to the end of that process. And man, when we go into that, listen, this is the hope of the creature. The hope ain't in what the creature's doing now. The hope is in what God is doing from the beginning to the end. Amen? Look at Ecclesiastes 9, 11. Boy, if you understand what I'm about to read you, man, you're going to understand a pretty good bit. I mean, just look, look at what he's talking about. He's talking about the swift, the strong, the wise, men of understanding, men of skill. But look at what happens to all those men. The end of verse 11. What happens to them all? Time and chance. Everybody, everybody thinks they're the center of God's universe. Like every little thing that's going on in their life is God just up there. There's things that are going to happen to all men. Time and chance. Everybody experiences death in life. Everybody experiences weeping and mourning, times of rejoicing, times of dancing. You get a flat tire on the road, that's chance. <laughs> it's not somebody trying to tell you something that you can't get out of a Bible. Amen? Time and chance happeneth to them all. The important thing about time is understanding what God has done from the beginning to the end. Psalm 19, and I'm closing. Psalm 19, I wanted to read you this verse. I'd love to keep going on this, man. I, I've been studying this stuff for weeks, about a week and a half now, Bill, and I've got, I've got notes after notes after notes up here. What set the process in motion right here was this act. God began time when he created the heaven and the earth. And I want you to understand something about that single act right there. Is that what man can see with his eyes and what he's living in right now tells every man on this earth something about God. And you don't, you don't listen. You could never show the atheist any better than what God has already showed him. It's not up to you to convince the atheist. If, if the creation can't do that, you can't do it. Paul said they're without excuse. Did you know that? They hold the truth in unrighteousness. You know what that means? That the world out here in its unrighteousness, they all possess a truth. 
And the truth that they possess is that God, the, he says, that which may be known of God is manifest in them, for God hath shewed it unto them. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Every atheist is going to stand before God without excuse. And it's not, listen, they didn't need a Bible. God showed it to them right there in the things that are made. Look at Psalm 19. Let me show you. It's what we call the first revelation of God. There's many ways that God reveals himself, and this is the first one. The heavens declare the glory of God. So there we see a declaration, right? The firmament sheweth his handiwork. So the heavens declare and the firmament shows something. Day unto day uttereth speech. Night unto night sheweth knowledge. There's declaration and things being shown. Now look at verse 3. There is no speech nor language. German, amen, Spanish, Portuguese, Chinese, Mandarin, Fujianese, whatever they call that stuff, Cantonese, Vietnamese, right? There's no speech nor language where the heavens and the firmament cannot be heard. Look at, look at what it says about the firmament. Look at what it says about days and nights. There is no speech nor language where their what? Voice is not heard. Their line is gone out through all the world. And their what? Words. Where did their words go? Into the world. You know what that tells me? Every nation, kindred, civilization on this earth has been spoken to. See that line there, their line? That took me a while to figure out what, what line is he talking about. And of course, I'm thinking just about a, a measuring line or just a straight line. Remember what Isaiah said, line must be upon line. The first line that God writes to all men and says to all men, he says through the days and nights and through the, through the heavens and the firmament, the creation speaks to every civilization. And you know what you got to do? You got to receive that by faith. Yeah. Amen. First thing God says to man, listen, I'm all powerful. Two things you, you can know. If somebody made that, you better believe they're all powerful. Number two, you can look at the order of it, the rain, the process of God, the earth bringing forth food and reproducing seed in itself to reproduce food. Not only do you see that there's an all-powerful God, you understand something about his divine nature, that he's a provider, that he cares, that there's love in him. But what does man do? They don't glorify him. Look at, look at verse 7. There's the second revelation. He gave you six verses on the cre creation, natural revelation. Look at verse 7. That's written revelation. The law of the Lord is what? What's it do? It converts the soul. Right? So once a man accepts this one, Right? That, that book begins with this fact. You know what that book is? It's a written revelation from God to those who believe that he is. That law converts his judgments, his testimonies, all those things down through there. But there's a third revelation. Not just written. Those things are written with paper and ink. There's a third revelation that God gives to man. And it's written upon his heart by his spirit, with his spirit. That's what we call spiritual revelation. You have natural revelation, written revelation, and then spiritual revelation. You know what we call those? Sons of God. Men who have the mind of Christ and know the mind of the creator back there. Listen, I'm not digging in a with a toothbrush trying to figure out where I come from. 
I know where I come from, and I've gone above and beyond. I know what God predestined and foreordained in his own mind before he ever did that in Genesis 1-1. Amen. Amen. He gave me a purpose in his son before the world began. I know the wisdom, Bill, that was ordained before all of this. The wisdom that God ordained before the world unto our glory. You see, natural man only knows God by natural law. What he can conceive by nature and then he corrupts that God here in his imagination. I know God not on the basis of natural revelation. I know God now by the right of sonship. I'm not a natural man. I'm a son. And I get to know God by the right of sonship. I get to know the mind of the Father because I have the mind of Christ. And so I'm not standing here trying to argue with the materialistic, profane babblers and pseudoscientists. God already showed them His eternal power and Godhead. They don't need me to show them that. God called me, put me in His Son, made me a son so that I could carry that book in my heart and display for the creature the manifestation of God and godliness in this world. I've got a much higher calling than to argue Carl Sagan and Neil deGrasse Tyson. This creature is now waiting for the manifestation of God's sons. Amen. Hope you any questions. I know it got, got kind of deep there towards the end. But eventually, Bill, this is what I love about it. Natural, written, spiritual, the manifestation of God's sons, and eventually the whole creation is going to be filled with the knowledge of God. Yep. Amen. <laughs> hey, man, you talk about a day, man. Yeah. Talk about a day. Hey, man, we won't have to worry about them teaching Darwinian evolution in the schools anymore, right? I mean, any questions on that? Don't worry about filling your head up with a bunch of useless scientific knowledge, guys. God's already showed it to them. You ain't got to worry about it. You get to the level of their conscience. Deal with them on the basis of, of God's wrath and judgment. Amen. But until, until a man accepts that God is, God don't have anything to say to him anyway. And so God, honest, honestly, you and God don't owe the atheist anything until he comes to acknowledge what is clearly seen and what God has showed them and come to God believing that he is. And he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Amen. Amen. All right, let's pray. Gracious Father, we thank you for this day, Lord. Oh, Father, I... I just felt like teaching on these things tonight, Lord, and I, I pray and, and, and ask God that your, 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 your sons and daughters here will have understanding of these things, Lord, that they may develop a better a method of dealing with natural men in the world. God, help them to understand that they are spiritual sons and daughters, that they have access to things that are unseen, things that, are, that have been hidden, and things that are, that are unsearchable and undiscernible to the natural man. Father, help them to understand that you've already revealed in nature your, your very power and, and divine nature to every man and every language and every culture and civilization in this world. And just help us to understand that our calling is not to take the things of nature and show them unto man, but our, our, our calling is to take the spiritual things that you've made known and, and, and showed us, Father, and those fruits of the Spirit teaches God how to live out and to manifest godliness in the world as, as your sons and your daughters. God, I pray for those that couldn't be here tonight, Lord. I pray that you would bless them and strengthen them, Father, and give them your grace and, and mercy. And, and I just pray that you would be with us all until we come back together. And we ask it all in the precious and holy name of our dear, blessed Redeemer, the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.